Great. Talking to my friend Peter here today. And Peter is very, very knowledgeable about not only posture and anatomy, all types of physical movement, and also just having fun. You're making, Peter was making a point about it has to be fun, <laughs> whatever you're doing. What is it that you uh, brought you into this field? Um, well, I've been a teacher all my life, uh, and I taught in schools, uh, so I've always um, valued the experience of showing people things and, and having them just, like, watching them have that moment where they figure something out, and that, that's a really, you know, feels good. feels good to do that. So that coupled with uh, my inability to sit still, so I've always been doing something, um, always been moving. You always wanted to move. Always wanted to move. Yeah. Uh, so... Couple those two things together, and you have, you know, an instructor, a trainer, a teacher. Right. So those and, things. And right now, you're you're how old now? Ninety-three. Ninety ninety-three years old. <laughs> and I look it. Um, I'm gonna be fifty-six shortly. Fifty-six. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that you teach yoga, mm -hmm. and how about how old were you when you got into yoga? Oh, it's interesting. Um, I, I did it for close to a year when I lived uh, in New York City, God, close to 30 years ago. 30 years ago. So, so yeah. there's so many different, now there's so many different schools of yoga. Mm. You know, as we all know, there's vinyasa, there's kundalini, there's yes. gentle, there's restorative. What's your take on it? What do you, how do you like to structure a class? <laughs> um, my focus is Iyengar yoga. Uh, that's what I started with years ago, and then now I'm finally back. Um, so my focus always is alignment. It's always alignment. It's always posture. Um, it's always balance before anything else, and making sure the mechanics are correct before people start to move uh, quickly. And I don't even like to move quickly in yoga. I like to move quickly on a bicycle, but with something like yoga, yoga for me, I have a really hard time... Um, Focusing on what I'm doing on a on a you know very deep interior level, if I'm moving quickly, there are people who can do it, but I'm not one of them. So uh, there's a demand for flow and there's demand for moving quickly, and I teach those classes. But when I when I have the um, say in what I'm doing, as opposed to like I want you to teach a flow class, I always come back to slow, focused, balance. Symmetry um, and mechanics. These are good just not only for warming up, like warming up, just doing this is great for the shoulders, you know, engaging in external rotation, biceps moving from inside to outside, keeping the chest up. And then you come back, you get the hips involved. And then I always like to do some of these too. So you have to slow down the momentum, moving from concentric to eccentric. Right, so always a little bit weak. So part of why we're doing these videos is to <clears throat> inspire people, anyone over 40, 50, 60 years old, try to get people who maybe are a little bit sedentary, mm. maybe just work out once a week and would like to do more to inspire them to do more. I mean, what's your, how would you get someone to do that? How, what, do you, what do you tell them? Well, um, that's part of my assessment. I always want to find out uh, what somebody wants, what they're looking for. Whenever somebody approaches you to ask for help, there's, there's a reason. And sometimes they're not entirely sure about what that reason is, so it takes some, some work just to find that. Other times they're very clear about it. Like, I want to do this. You know, I want to accomplish this task. I want to get stronger in this part of my body. You know, of course, where we are as a society, I want to lose weight, I want to look a certain way. I mean, those kind of things, I, I, tend, to, um, I tend to ask people who want those things, get more, be more specific with me. You know, like, why do you want to do that? Um, so I think finding out what that is, and then I always try and figure out what people like to do. Like, what do you like to do? Oh, I like to hike. Okay, great, let's right. start there, you know? Um, That's such a good point because I find that a lot of people are coming to work out because they see what other people are doing. They're, they're copying people at the gym or they're being told by a personal trainer you have to do this, but right. you like to hike or you like to swim or you like to cycle, there's so many ways to exercise. Yes, yeah. yeah. So I try and figure out what they like um, and then I figure out, you know, I, I, I determine what they like about that. 
And then I encourage them to do that as much as possible. Uh, and then I find things, modalities that, that um, tie in with that somehow. You know, so uh, if you're a hiker, stability is very important, right? Uh, it's, it's important in any kind of movement, but I try to work generally with everybody on balance and finding fun ways to work on balance. Um, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but uh, working unilateral, unilaterally meaning uh, left and right side, as opposed to trying to do everything with both sides at once bilaterally. Right, Peter was saying that maybe <clears throat> if you have a bar with weights on it and you're picking both at the same time and you have some type of compromise in one side of your body, you'll be um, using one side more than the other. You'll be tilting, which can easily bring about an injury, right? Right, right. So it's, you know, it's um, just trying to keep things balanced, looking for symmetry. Um, just if, if you can focus on the mechanics, also again, firing, timing of the muscles, especially with the shoulder pushing, um, trying to eliminate compensation in any way. But again, making, finding ways that are fun for people to do those things. So you said like a, they're, somebody's at a gym, uh, they're relying on a trainer who says, well, do, you know, do shoulder press with a barbell. And what if that hurts the person that they're told to do it so they still do it? Let's find another way of doing it. Let's use, let's use barbells instead. Let's use kettlebells, um, sorry, dumbbells or uh, kettlebells. Um, there's so many, you know, rubber bands. I love using rubber bands. Rubber bands are great, especially for the shoulder. Yeah, the rubber bands are amazing. Yeah. yeah. So whether you're teaching yoga or some other type of therapy, is there a certain set of muscles that you're trying to focus on with people or do you just go by the individual? I mean, it can be hard in a group setting yeah. because obviously some people need one thing and another. Do you have a certain group of muscles that you're always focusing on? That's a really good question. Um, by and large, uh, my initial approach with anybody or with any class is the, um, the structural muscles, the small muscles that surround the joint. And even if um, somebody is seeing me to develop greater strength, like working, you know, the big block engines, the big movers, um, the thighs and the chest, you know, the bigger muscles, the powerhouse muscles, I always start with structural stuff because if that's not working properly, then bad things happen. It's been my experience that, uh, you know, if somebody's not lined up, they're going to hurt themselves when they start to move a lot of weight, relying on these big movers. Um, if the structural muscles are not balanced and they're not, you know, timing is everything, if they're not firing when they should, if one's, you know, slightly behind, if there's a lag, um, people run into problems. So my focus is always small group muscles, stuff that surrounds the joints, and I try and make assessments, whether it's with an individual or whether it's a class full of people. I try and do you know, a really quick assessment. Who have I got in the room? Mm -hmm. It's kind of hard when you got 40 people, but if you have 10, you know, it's pretty quick. Yeah. You, you run them through some basic movements and you can tell really quickly like, oh, this person has like a hyperlordotic curve or this person obviously has back problem. You know, and most men, <laughs> have typical issues yeah. with their spine and you know with presenting themselves forward with a big chest and kind of a collapsed lower back and you know these are these are generalities but pretty quickly you know you, you see patterns in people I'm sure you, you realize that in your classes too like you, you see these things on a regular basis and it becomes um, with time and it's still like I have light years to go but it's, it's interesting to be able to identify these things um, quickly, you know, more quickly than in the past. I like doing pull-ups a lot. Um, I think it's very important to brachiate. We're monkeys, so we need to use our arms. Uh, and I think we're running a lot of problems just using our legs um, because then we neglect the upper half. So I think pull-ups are great. I'm not a big fan of pull-ups or chins. These are usually referred to as chins. Um, they hurt my shoulders, that's why. Uh, and it's probably for me doing them improperly when I was younger. But I really like these outriggers, these things that go out so that your grip is here, or um, the rings that I have on the ceiling, because then I have greater range of motion and I can engage my chest and my upper back. So I'm really interested in using my back shoulder, right? My scapulas, very important. As opposed to, it's scary when you watch people do pull-ups. Um, you know, putting so much stress on my deltoids and what we traditionally think of as the shoulder joint, right? 
So I try to bring my shoulder blades down the back ribs, and I try to get, um, actually, what I'm focusing on these days is leading with my sternum, really my manubrium, and I'm driving my lower tips of my scapulas up into my chest, and that's what's bringing me up. Because then I'm stronger, right? I'm lifting up using so much more than just my shoulders. What about sugar? I find personally, I, I've tried many different diets, but the one thing personally and everyone's different that has made the biggest change in my life is giving up sugar. And I find that the, the lack of inflammation, the lack of like this nervous energy after having sugar, what's your take on that? Um, I agree with you entirely. Uh, luckily, I don't have much of a sweet tooth, but I know a lot of people who do, and it's very difficult for them to stop. But yeah, the inflammatory thing, my God, just that alone uh, makes a huge difference. Um, one of the reasons I don't have a sweet tooth is it has always made me feel ill whenever I have um, too much sugar. Mm -hmm. And you know, unless you eat, the more it affects you when you do have it. So it's, what again, trying to keep it fun, I will save those times to ingest sugar when it's a really good baked good. Like uh -huh. somebody I know who's a really good baker and yeah. she brings a cake or something, I'll have a small slice of that. So, right. you know, moderation, but by and large, I don't, you I know, mean, I never use, I never add sugar to anything and I'm always looking for um, alternatives, you know, black strap molasses, there's like date juice now, which is very popular. Yeah, um, there's all kind of sugar alternatives now. Whether yeah. it's coconut sugar or st coconut sugar. stevia. I mean, right. a lot of people will make a face when I say stevia because it has a funny aftertaste, but if you, you know, lose a little bit in it in something or um, the different alcohol-based sugars, mm -hmm. of course, yeah, not so yeah. inflammatory. Right, getting rid of the inflammatory um, aspect and, you know, in, in everything that you eat. So these, what else, these what else? carbs, Anything else you've changed along the way as you got older with your well, diet? Well, um, you're, you're a vegan, right? Um, Pretty much. Close to vegan. Close to it, yeah. A real vegan I'm, wouldn't call me a vegan. Right. <laughs> I'm, I'm striving for that. I, yeah. you know, when I was doing CrossFit a lot, I ate a lot of red meat and all that stuff. I, my wife and I have pretty much given up red meat. We do have a good friend who's a hunter, so he'll every so often drop like 20 pounds of deer meat on us. So I, I will eat that. High in cholesterol, but lean. Um, so getting away from me, um, I love fish, but I'm scared of fish because, you know, yeah. mercury, there's so much pollution in the ocean, it's not regulated well, um, but I love fish. Uh, so I, I oftentimes find myself eating um, chicken, and I try to get local chicken uh, um, so that it doesn't have hormones and stuff. But going more plant-based, trying to have at least one massive salad a day, you know, ideally two, mm -hmm. and then filling in with other things. I mean, more and more professional athletes are eating vegan or close to it. Everybody used to say like, well, I'm an athlete, so I can't give up meat. You can give up meat. Yeah, it's, and, it's been documented now. We know that we know that you can be vegan. It's not like a big myth anymore. Right. You can be vegan and be very strong and fast and an Olympic athlete. Right. It's been proven. High performance. It just depends. Maybe it just depends on the individual a little bit. I think that's true. And more and more, um, the 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 ethical issues. Uh, I mean, we are surrounded by my dog and my cat. Um, of killing animals to, to eat. I you know I have very mixed feelings about that, and the older I get, the more uncomfortable I am with the notion of raising animals to slaughter. Um, I mean, people gotta eat, and different cultures, you know, and at different times, people have had to kill animals, but now we're really at a point, you know, there's the, there, there's the cruelty aspect, and there's also the impact on the climate on climate too, that right. can't be ignored with methane. So, so. push-ups, I find push-ups a very quick way to get stronger, but I find people do them in the wrong way a lot. So what would you, if, if I'm doing a push-up, Peter, and my back is kind of like this, and I'm going up and down like this, ouch, what's wrong with that? <laughs> I don't even want you to do it that many times. Um, <laughs> what's wrong with that is you're dumping into your lumbar spine, right? So you're putting a lot of stress on these five vertebra. And you're also, you're kind of winging your scapulas here a bit. Right, <laughs> right that's winging as opposed to... Yes, yeah. push up with a plus. Um, so 
you know, the deltoids are weak and they tend to roll forward, right? And that's when they're compromised, right? That's when the tendons in the shoulder are compromised. So you really want to try to use your chest and your upper back. And the only way to do that is to engage, I don't like the word core, but to engage the abdomen and the ribs, the lower floating front ribs, thinking about tucking in on either side of the belly button, left and right. right. And it's not so much of a grip, it's just a gentle pulling in that you really need to maintain all the time, right? Whether you're in a push-up or whether you're walking, you know, certainly when you're lifting something, it's constantly engaged because if, if you don't have the anterior working, then the posterior is going to suffer, right? It's going to collapse. It's going to go anterior or posterior tilt and either extreme, extreme is not good. You want both to be much more even on both yeah. sides. Yeah. So people work too much just on their six pack. Right. Or not the, not the, the rectus abdominis yeah. as opposed to the transverse. Um, and you know, that's crucial too, but it's, it's incorporating everything drawing in and up. Like the thing that drives me nuts is, um, you hear it in a lot of Pilates classes now too, where people are told to flatten their spines, right? So to get rid of the lordotic curve when they're doing stomach work. No, you want that curve. You have to, you have to deal with that curve. Mm -hmm. it, you want it to exist and you want to be strong <laughs> like this. Well, what if I'm here? What do you think about this kind of thing? Um, that's, that's better for your lower back. I would encourage you to put your elbows in more. In here? Yes, draw them closer to the sides. And the, the thing that I talk about all the time with people is pushing into the inner hand, the apex between the thumb and the index finger, and think of screwing the hands into the ground. So it's like, if this is the ground, I'm doing this with my arms so that I can activate my lats, my back, not just caving into the shoulder joint, right? Hmm. So if you screw into the ground as, yeah, as, as you're going So they don't really move, but that's the emphasis, oh, right? I see, and that kind of gets the elbows in. Gets the elbows in, lifts the chest, brings right. the elbows back, the sh sorry, the, the shoulders back and down, and lifts the chest. Really important to keep the chest lifted while you're doing these, because it's so easy to collapse the shoulders, right? So you really want to make sure that the shoulders are open and really the way to do that is to lead with the sternum forward. So if you're on the ground, so if you're on the ground. All the way down? Yeah, start off there. So start off almost like, like cobra, but with um, neutral cervical spine, so the crown of your head's lifting forward. Yeah, and come up, push up. Yep, leading with the sternum going forward at all times. So it's like, it's chaturanga. Chaturanga is really the best push-up. They're harder that way, but so what? Right. You know, that's, you're doing it because it's hard, not because it's easy. Um, but 